My name is Christine Chung, and I'm a professor of radiology from UCSD. And over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll be discussing rotator cuff and uh, primarily on MRI and going over really the basics, the things that you need to know to begin to address the rotator cuff. So our schedule for the next 20 minutes is to go over anatomy, rotator cuff mechanical failure, and the topics that we're going to specifically go over are tendinosis versus tear and characterization of rotator cuff tears, really stressing location and the description how we do that, whether or not we can identify chronicity with respect to the pathology and complications that the patient can encounter after having had a rotator cuff tear. Well, if we begin with the basics, we have to review rotator cuff anatomy, and the classic Netter diagrams really do it so well. So as we look at this one, looking at the shoulder anteriorly, you can see that the subscapularis is this really broad muscle, has multiple tendon fascicles that come across to attach to the lesser tuberosity, and the enthesial anatomy will address a little bit closer in just a few moments. Now, if we look at the shoulder from a posterior vantage point, you can see the supraspinatus and the suprascapular fossa, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Here, taking the humerus out of the articulation and looking at the glenoid, here you can see anteriorly the coracoid and the acromion, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and then more anteriorly, the subscapularis. And were we to look at this netter diagram with the muscle showing here, again, subscapularis, scapularis, this Y-shaped bone in the sagittal imaging plane representing the scapula, supraspinatus and the suprascapular fossa, infraspinatus and teres minor. So again, showing you the osseous structures here with this complex anatomy of the scapula, the glenoid articular surface, and the humerus, what I really want you to notice here is that the osseous structure is going to accommodate the muscles. So as we think about localizing muscle and tendon, we're going to have osseous landmarks, but don't forget, we can follow the muscle from proximal sites of attachment to distal sites of attachment, and that's going to help us as we move beyond the basics after we get more uh, information and foundation of knowledge from our basic studies. So looking here, image on the left is the humerus and in internal rotation. If you were to imagine what an x-ray would look like, you see two crescents. The superior crescent is the articular surface. The inferior crescent is actually the greater tuberosity. So this humerus and in internal rotation, here's your greater tuberosity, your intertubercular sulcus, and off of the image would be the lesser tuberosity. As you look at this greater tuberosity, realize a few things. There's a lot of surface area here, number one. Number two, look at the change in osseous contour, and this is an anatomic theme that will recur all over the body. Changes in osseous contour often represent changes or different soft tissue attachment sites. Shown here, a superior a middle and an inferior facet or change in the overall contour, and those actually do correlate with changes in soft tissue attachment. So the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor correlating with those facets on the greater tuberosity. Now again, this is the basic set of anatomy, and we're going to see many variations in different people, but we're going to start with this basic idea of these, uh, these attachment sites. So now let's look at some MR images of the shoulder in the coronal imaging plane. As you start very anteriorly, you're going to see the subscapularis, multiple tendon fascicles coming across to attach to that lesser tuberosity. The next image you see shows the long head of the biceps in the bicipital groove. Now, an important point here is that right after you see this biceps tendon, the next most posterior image will show you the leading edge or anterior most fibers of the attaching supraspinatus. So this is a part of your supraspinatus on the image that you're still seeing some of the biceps. This is an area that's very easy to miss 
these leading edge or anterior most fiber supraspinatus tears. One other thing that can help you again is to remember that your suprascapular fossa shaped like a bullet accommodates the supraspinatus muscle and tendon so we can follow those tendon fibers across to really help us identify the attachment sites distally. Moving more posteriorly, still in the suprascapular fossa, you see the shape of the muscle tendon fascicles, then moving into that more horizontal facet. I am focusing really on the muscle, not so much on the labrum in this lecture, but clearly there's labral pathology here as well as acromioclavicular joint pathology. As we move more posterior, you're going to start to see a change in the osseous anatomy, and this is the spinoglenoid notch. So you're moving from that suprascapular region into cuts that are posterior to the scapula, and you can see the change in shape of the muscle, the change in the orientation of the tendon fibers, and that's telling you that you're moving into the infraspinatus. And then, of course, here posterior to the scapula, you're seeing the infraspinatus spinatus proper coming over to its attachment and the facet shape has changed more oblique in nature. So you're using your osseous anatomy as well as muscle and tendon to really identify those areas of attachment. In the sagittal plane, as you move very far to the periphery of the joint, you see the rotator cuff tendons here sort of sitting on top of the humerus like the icing on a cupcake. As you move more anterior here, you can see the lesser tuberosity. And I like to localize the subscapularis on the sagittal imaging plane because it really gives you an idea how much of the lesser tuberosity there is and the superior to inferior extent of the lesser tuberosity subscapularis attachment. Here you're seeing the biceps and then the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and some of the teres minor. As we move even more towards the center of the body, you can see that we're seeing more muscle. And as you move here all the way centrally, on this sagittal image, it's a nice one to look at the overall muscle bulk, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Once again, as you look at these sagittal images that are very far medially, we're able to judge the overall muscle volume, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor. In the axial imaging plane, we'll do something similar, looking at various different levels here at the top of the labrum and glenoid. As you move to a central glenoid cut, as you're considering the top to bottom cranial to caudal dimension of the shoulder, here's your subscapularis and a cut showing your lesser tuberosity attachment site. We'll go over the intimate anatomic relationship of the subscapularis attachment to the biceps and bicipital groove a little bit later in this discussion. And then this image showing you that the subscapularis has an attachment not only to that lesser tuberosity, but also to the humerus. So this showing the humeral attachment of the subscapularis. Well, now that we have the rotator cuff anatomy down, we have to think about how we're going to localize abnormalities that we identify. We can talk about localization of the rotator cuff really from medial to lateral or from the enthesis in this case, the enthesial attachment or soft tissue attachment to bone. We also talk about a critical zone of the tendon. And the critical zone is generally described as being about one centimeter proximal to the osseous attachment site. And this has been referred to as the critical zone. This histologic preparation showing us vascularity in the tissues emphasizes the idea that tendons are relatively avascular tissues, taking their vascular supply from bone and from areas of musculotendinous junction. So that the area between those two vascular rich regions results in a so-called watershed area or area with less vascularity. And one thing that we remember is that if we have lesions in tissue, we do need vascular supply in order to heal those regions.
The third area is we consider medial to lateral be at the musculotendinous junction. And while we don't identify the vast majority of mechanical failure in the rotator cuff, there are some examples where pathology from mechanical failure will indeed affect the musculotendinous junction. We can also describe pathology with respect to whether or not it involves the articular to bursal side. Articular sided fibers, as they uh, are named, involve that which encroaches or um, surfaces onto the articulation. Intra-substance tears and bursal-sided tears can also be encountered. Full-thickness tears are tears that involve the rotator cuff from the articular to the bursal side through and through. And when we have full-thickness tearing of the cuff, the next thing that we have to characterize is how much of the anterior to posterior component of the cuff is involved. So if you were to look at this diagram here looking down on the supraspinatus, on the right the image is showing you a coronal vantage point, we would say that there's a focal full thickness tear involving the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus and as we think about the width it would be approximately one-third if you consider the entire anterior to posterior dimension. As we think about full thickness and full width tears, there are a few secondary findings that we try to describe. The first, retraction. How far is the tendon retracted from the site of attachment? What is the gap? The second, do we identify atrophy or volume loss within the muscle? And we do that so that we have some ideas about whether or not that tendon can be easily repaired. As we consider volume loss in the rotator cuff, one sign that has been described in the literature is the so-called tangent line. In the sagittal imaging plane, we come to the image where the scapula looks like a Y. We draw a line along the anterior and posterior margins of the scapula, and we assess the supraspinatus in this region. We want to know if the supraspinatus extends to or above that tangent line, and if it does, we would say that the volume is within normal limits. If the supraspinatus is below that line or has rather extensive fatty infiltration, we would say that there's volume loss involving that supraspinatus. We look for the degree of retraction and the amount of volume loss because our orthopedic surgeons use these things as surrogates or ways to try to predict the compliance of the tendon. So the idea here being that if the tendon is retracted to the level of the glenoid, some surgeons may say greater than two centimeters of retraction from the greater tuberosity emphasis, or if there is significant volume loss, that tendon will not be compliant. You will not be able to draw it back to its normal site of attachment for an anatomic repair. Well, as we think about rotator cuff pathology, we're going to identify degenerative changes and try to distinguish those from tears. As we look at the major ways to distinguish degenerative tendinosis from tearing, we're going to look at morphology and signal intensity. As we consider morphology, we don't want the tendon to be too thick or too thin. As we look at the signal intensity, we're going to compare short TE sequences, T1 or proton density, to longer TE sequences or fluid sensitive sequences. We look at the signal intensity. If the signal brightens in the short TE sequence, but does not brighten to the level of simple fluid on the fluid sensitive sequence, we would characterize those changes as tendinosis or degenerative change in the tendon rather than tearing. 
If, however, we see bright signal intensity in the fluid-sensitive sequence and abnormal morphology, in this case a piece missing, we'll call that a tear. As we look at the characterization of location in this case, this tear is articular-sided and involves about 50% of the undersurface fibers focally. Less than 50% would be considered low-grade. 50% of the fibers from the articular to bursal side considered moderate grade, greater than 50% considered high grade. So in this case, a moderate grade focal articular sided tear. As you consider morphology, there are a few other things I'd like to include in your search pattern. I would like you to look at the caliber of the tendon, starting at the level of the musculotendinous junction. As you follow that tendon distally all the way to the attachment site, look to see whether or not there's a change in the caliber. In this specific case, you can see that this tendon has a tapered appearance, and that's telling you that there's undersurface tearing that has occurred. This can be easy to miss because we don't see a focal area where we see disruption of the undersurface fibers, and with chronic undersurface tears, it has a smooth and tapered appearance. A second finding in your search pattern that can help you is whether or not the emphasis is completely covered. In this case, as you look at the caliber change and the very thin thickness of the tendon at the emphasis, the other finding is that the emphasis is uncovered. So that also is a secondary clue that this was under surface or articular sided fiber tearing that then became smooth and tapered over time. So that will help you not to miss these findings. Intrasubstance tearing, as the name suggests, is abnormal increased signal intensity, in this case bright as compared to simple fluid within the substance that as far as you can tell from the images does not connect or involve the bursal or articular sided tears. If we think about undersurface tears with intra-substance extension along the long axis of the fibers and in some cases the development of a cyst at the musculotendinous junction. This type of failure involves both articular sided and intra-substance tearing and that has been referred to as a delamination. These delaminations can result in increased signal intensity or cyst formation at the musculotendinous junction and that if it forms has has been referred to in the literature as the sentinel cyst and can be a clue that an intrasubstance delamination actually exists. So if we were to look at the sagittal imaging plane, here you see the high signal intensity at the musculotendinous junction. Moving to the coronal plane, we can see that there's articular sided tearing with this very, very prominent intrasubstance delamination extending to the large cyst along the muscular tendinous junction. Often these intrasubstance delaminations are much more subtle than this image I'm showing you. As you think about bursal sided pathology, we're again looking at the overall tendon, nice and low in signal intensity, but as you reach the emphasis, you can see that there's partial discontinuity of the fibers. In this case, there's fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and as you look at the bursal side, of the more proximal tendon, you may characterize it as being slightly irregular. I want to caution you about this because in cases where you've got subacromial subdeltoid bursal fluid, remember that the bursa is lined by synovium and there is probably a component of synovitis. So it can be very difficult in these cases to characterize whether or not you're dealing with synovitic change versus bursal sided abnormality. In this case, the arthroscopic correlation verified that there was no bursal sided tearing, but rather there was synovitis at the bursal side. So be careful when you're looking at the bursal side of the cuff and trying to determine whether or not there's inflammatory change in synovitis versus tearing. In the image on our left, it's a bit easier because we see also partial discontinuity at the endothelial attachment.
Well, when we went over anatomy, I cautioned you about looking very closely at the leading edge of the supraspinatus, starting anteriorly. Here's your lesser tuberosity. Here's the biceps, and you can see on this image some tissue extending to the region of the bicipital groove and the anterior margin of the greater tuberosity shown on the next image. Then, as you look at the horizontal facet or where that supraspinatus should attach, we don't see anything at all, and we see that the tendon is retracted very far medially, a few centimeters distal to the glenoid. So as you look at these three images, it would be easy to understand why you might call this full thickness, full width tearing of the supraspinatus, but you have to, again, be very careful about the leading edge and whether or not they're intact fibers. As you look at the sagittal image, one clue in this case is that your muscle volume is preserved. If you've got full thickness, full width tearing, and you believe it to be chronic in nature, the secondary finding that you should probably see is some volume loss in the supraspinatus. If you don't, look back at the leading edge to be sure that there are not some preserved fibers. Well, here's an example of a full thickness partial width tear of the supraspinatus. As you look at the discontinuous fibers, one thing that I'd also like you to notice and to remember is that the rotator cuff, while not classically something we equate with shoulder stability, is very important in dynamic stabilization of the shoulder. So when we have focal tears of the supraspinatus, perhaps even the infraspinatus, we can in some ways destabilize the rotator cuff very minimally perhaps so minimal that it wouldn't be determined on physical examination. So you can imagine without a completely intact rotator cuff, particularly your supraspinatus, you may get some motion up and down of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid, and that might cause over time degenerative changes in the superior labrum. So take a look to see whether or not you feel in the setting of focal full thickness tears of the rotator cuff that you see small changes in alignment and degenerative changes in other tissues that could reflect uh, changes in the overall joint stability. With respect to the supraspinatus, this micro-instability pattern has been described in the literature and is known to occur sort of makes practical sense too. So in looking at this image, you've got this tear of the supraspinatus. You've got superior subluxation of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid, and you see the mass effect on the superior labrum. So the rotator cuff is an important stabilizer. Mild changes in stability can then cause stress or chronic repetitive microtrauma on other tissues. Full thickness, full width tearing causes a more severe change, obviously, in the overall alignment. Here, this elevation of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid, not minor at all, very significant, and to the point that the humerus no longer articulates with the glenoid, but rather articulates with the superior margin of the glenoid as well as the tissues along the coracoacromial arch. So over time, you'll see degenerative changes in the labrum, mechanical erosion at the undersurface of the acromion, perhaps even the AC articulation proper. Another example here where we can see that superior subluxation of the humerus, and in this case, you can also see the findings of chronicity, supraspinatus and infraspinatus, severely atrophic, and this leads us ultimately to uh, a finding or an entity called rotator cuff arthropathy. So as you have this failure of the rotator cuff, Generally, full thickness, full width tearing of the supraspinatus and often part of the infraspinatus as well. You see the findings here of this humerus really articulating at the level of the coracoacromial arch. What happens in this case is the mechanical excavation of the humerus 
articulating with the acromion, and because you can still get abduction up to 90 degrees from the intact deltoid, there's also erosion of the greater tuberosity so that the humerus starts to look smooth without having that well-delineated greater tuberosity. We see reactive marrow changes there. You see, again, the mechanical erosion at the undersurface of the acromion. So the rotator cuff being a very, very important stabilizer of the joint. We said that muscular tendinous junction failure in and of itself can occur in the rotator cuff. A nice example shown here, the T2 fat suppressed fastbenecho coronal image on the right. This is a T1 fat suppressed image after a dilute gadolinium solution has been placed into the articulation, MR arthrography here. So the high signal intensity, the edema shown on the T2 fat suppressed, but because this is a T1 weighted image, we don't see that well at all. So the importance here that if you're doing arthrography, you need to have a fluid sensitive sequence to assess things like the muscle. In this case, you can see that the failure has occurred at tendons that contribute to the tensile tendon proximal to the enthesis so that if the arthroscopist were to look for this failure, they would be looking inside the joint, no communication to the articular surface. They would be looking in the bursa, no communication to the bursal surface so that these lesions are really diagnosed through imaging evaluation. It's been described in the orthopedic literature and they have been referred to as the novel lesions axial fluid sensitive sequence here you can see that edema at the muscular tendinous junction in this case as you look at the MR sequence you can see the areas of high signal intensity at the muscular tendinous junction and in the chronic phase you often see atrophic change or fatty infiltration at the site of the previous edema We'll finish our discussion today by just seeing a few examples of subscapularis pathology. Here's a 3D volumetric render rendering of the glenoid and the humerus. Here, the humerus in external rotation, lesser tuberosity and intertubercular sulcus shown here. And this article by Gleason talked about different zones of the subscapularis and the attachment site to the lesser tuberosity in the humerus, again, pointing out that you have multiple tendon fascicles and don't forget that it's quite a broad surface area that you're dealing with as you think about the attachment site. The other important thing that this article discusses is that the subscapularis findings fibers rather come to the lesser tuberosity and some of those fibers extend along the floor of the bicipital groove. Other fibers cross over the bicipital groove and actually reinforce and stabilize the biceps so that subscapularis and biceps pathology are intimately associated. If you've got a subscap lesion, you need to look closely at your biceps. Another article by you and his collaborators actually also re-emphasize this idea of the broad attachment site of the subscapularis to the lesser tuberosity as well as to the humerus. I like looking again in the sagittal plane shows you the entire lesser tuberosity shelf and then you can localize on the axial images. On the axial image, you see the discontinuity of subscapularis from the lesser tuberosity on the sagittal image, you can localize that to the superior lesser tuberosity attachment, and we see the biceps with abnormal morphology attenuated, and it's subluxing out of the groove because the fibers here that cross under and over are also torn. Another example in this case of the subscapularis, we're going to look at the caliber of this tendon. So look how thick it is here. As you move towards the attachment, you see it thins remarkably. The other issue here with its signal intensity, bright signal intensity extending here from the last tuberosity into the substance. So it's complex tearing, articular sided intrasubstance delamination. And we also see the biceps groove is empty and the biceps dislocated or subluxed into 
uh, the articulation. As you look in the next cut, you can see again that subluxed biceps that's displaced into the articulation. Just one more example here showing you that the lesser tuberosity emphasis is bare. We can see the fibers retracted to the level of the glenoid. And as we move even more inferiorly, we can see that while the lesser tuberosity attachment is torn, the humeral attachment of that subscapularis is intact. We want to look for the biceps. It is attenuated. It's, it's thin, but still present within the groove. So over the course of our time together, we've gone over the anatomy and rotator cuff mechanical failure. I hope that you've enjoyed our time together.